My pleasure to have uh, maybe uh, introduce Matt as the head of um, ESG and corporate responsibility engagement. And without like going through all your bio, like, tell us at a large bank like JP Morgan, uh, to you know, how does climate risk uh, factor in through all the possible, you know, divisions or activities the bank performs? All the divisions. Do we have an hour? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Thank you for having me, Pedro. Uh, nice to see you, Bruno. Nice to see you all. Um, 39 years ago, I worked for Greenpeace, and now I work for J.P. Morgan. Uh, and I think that's one sign of the kind of changes that um, that kind of expertise, insight, sort of re the ability to reach into a, what appears to be a very chaotic world of, of politics and activism and swiftly moving science and ratings, et cetera. And I would say in the last year, there's been a sea change in the kind of embrace and understanding. Uh, certainly at the top of our house, all of our top leadership have been taking crash courses in uh, climate change and climate risk. Uh, CDP has been a pioneer since uh, 20 years on forcing disclosure. Uh, two years ago, the world banking regulators picked up that uh, mantle, uh, uh, it's called the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, sort of wonky and a lot of syllables, but they, the, uh, it, it's the, 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 the G20 finance regulators said to the banks, the asset managers, the asset owners, the insurers, if you're gonna access public capital markets, you need to get a handle on your climate related financial risk and you need to disclose it. And that, that one thing, is, I would say, changed us more than any other single thing because our regulators are calling. Um, across JP Morgan today, we have a large asset and wealth management business. We have global heads of sustainable investing in each. So in asset management, that's where JP Morgan manages the portfolio. Uh, in wealth management, it's where it's third party product. Uh, so there you have, we're bringing impact investing, ESG investing, carbon tilted investing, uh, ESG integration. By the way, how many are you familiar with the language of ESG? Oh, good. <laughs> um, it really is, it's, it's, it's an awkward terminology. It's awkward to have it as your title. Um, but it's, it's kind of a way the investment world's wrapped its head around. And, and climate change is the number one ESG issue across just about every industry. So our asset and wealth management business, it's around product, it's around engagement. Uh, you all may have seen Larry Fink from BlackRock's letter around, you know, we all sort of have to get our heads around this. I would say our bank has been at it a bit longer than our asset management business. Um, we're, just full disclosure, we're one of the largest energy banks in the world. Uh, outside China, we're probably the largest, we're, we're the largest fossil fuel bank outside China. Uh, we're also the largest green bank in the world. We do about $50 billion a year in financing of various forms of green, low carbon, renewable. Um, so in those two businesses, in, in the, on the green side, there's probably seven or eight businesses that are chasing opportunities that are low carbon. Very interestingly, uh, in, our, in our energy business, the core energy business, oil and gas, power, we have an energy transition banking team. Because as the, the fossil fuel industry embraces the real scientific limits that require emissions reductions, and as you probably saw BP's announcement that it would be net zero by 2050, 50% reduction by 2035, which is a Paris aligned commitment, they're gonna need to buy things. They're gonna need to b diversify their business model. And that drives mergers and acquisition, it drives capital raising, Bruno was saying in his opening remarks that Wall Street, et cetera, need to, to drive capital in a different direction. And this is exactly what that team is doing, responding to the sort of external landscape that says you won't be doing what you're doing in 20 years. And so at some point, you've got to get on the road. Uh, in our real estate organization, we've made a commitment to be 100% renewable by uh, the end of this year for our own operations. So that effectively makes us carbon neutral, frankly, as a bank. Our impact on the world is much more in our financing and our, in our asset management than it is in our operations. We sort of thought we ought, we ought to do that as well. 
Our markets business, that's actually most of the revenue of our investment bank is in markets, not banking. Uh, we have an ESG advisory team there. Uh, I would say in the last year and a half, we've probably hired 15 new people in jobs around climate risk, ESG advice, energy transition, uh, deepening our renewable energy bench. So w I know we'll get to this later, but w what's in this for an MBA? There's actually an increasingly rich sort of series of pathways about what you can do in your, in your career. Perfect. And um, maybe spend a little bit more time on throw out some, you know, other terms like green bonds, what those are, and like particular products that are designed around that, and, you know, how, how are those coming about, so what, what sort of growth are you seeing, and how much is JP Morgan doing of this? So, um, if you look at the climate challenge and you look at the trillions of dollars needed to go into the transformation to a sort of lower carbon energy economy, you don't get there through equity. You don't get there through private equity. You don't get there through public equity. You get there through fixed income. That's where 90% of that capital's got to come. So some innovative bankers uh, uh, about seven or eight years ago decided to brand something called a green bond. It's just a bond. Uh, it's a bond that an, a company issues and off of its debt capital markets sort of or treasury function. So very core mainstream financial function now issuing something called green. What their contract is is that they will, the financial terms are, all, are usually the same, uh, recourse to the balance sheet of the issuer, uh, not recourse to the projects in the pipeline. Uh, but a commitment to ring fence the proceeds and to make sure that the proceeds of that go to something that you as the issuer have disclosed as green. 80% of it's renewable energy. There's a few deep green forestry related bonds. And that market, uh, the outstandings is almost half a trillion. Uh, it's on the order of 100, 150 billion a year. Uh, it needs to grow faster. Um, that's probably the biggest single, that's about 20% of our green finance. There's a lot of public finance that is, is going green. Cities, states, and countries. France issued a, a 7 billion euro green bond. Poland issued uh, a green bond. Uh, so you, you've got a lot in, in, in public finance. Uh, and then mergers and acquisitions, as I mentioned earlier, buying of, of cleaner companies. Um, and then, the folks in markets do a lot of structured products, which are really, as a non-banker, they confuse me. But uh, they, they, they will structure something, like the one that I saw that was amazing, is a World Bank green bond to kind of hedge the downside risk, and then an ESG index to kind of give you equity exposure, and all this packaged together in a single security, and we place that with an insurance company or an asset management company, but those are like 80, 100 million dollar trades. Those are, you don't, you're not doing, because there's a lot of structuring involved. Um, we, we trade renewable energy all day long, we trade carbon credits all day long, that's a whole other part of our commodities business is, is, is in the game. There's, a, in the U.S., there's a tax regime that rewards investments in renewable energy. We do a lot of tax-driven uh, banking. So it really is, how many of you are going into finance? So it's fun. Uh, you'll be able to, to get engaged in this, and it's super interesting. And, and the other thing is, senior management will know you long before they ever would have had you gone through a mainstream finance pathway. Senior management is watching this stuff. They like this stuff. And people who are sort of making their names in this area are, are getting, and it changes your career path. It accelerates. It genuinely does. It's a great opportunity to circle back to Bruno. In your opening remarks, you said the challenge to make corporates really walk to talk and capex to really go towards uh, addressing climate change and so forth. So, from where you stand, like, what role do you see? Do you see the flow of capital really gearing up, or do you still feel like this is only a drop in the bucket? Are we still? Where are we in the in the ramp up that? You know, we need to, to address the, the challenge. I mean, you know, it, we're not where we need to be. Uh, I think, as Matt says, you know, the, 
the acceleration is tremendous, and so you could, you know, say, you know, the, the, the numbers are in like the triple digits of growth, but of course they're starting from a smaller place than they need to. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I can't think of a single large publicly held, or frankly increasingly also privately held organization that's not taking this seriously, that's not really weighing where they're going to deploy capital, not just again, not just because of their conscience, but because of returns. I mean, you, you heard Larry Kramer on CNBC uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago saying as far as he's concerned, fossil fuels are dead, not because they're dead. I mean, they're going to be around for a long time. It's just in terms of like who would put a lot of money that isn't there today in those businesses rather than something else. Uh, so at a market level, you know, we're seeing just a lot of awareness of, you know, um, where, where do those opportunities exist? What are the returns? You know, every year that goes by, uh, the, you know, there's a longer history. So whether it's, again, ESG aligned portfolios, even in 401ks, you know, a lot of companies are like, well, you know, our employees want ESG aligned 401ks, but is there enough kind of performance data to where we could kind of bank their retirement on something that, so every year, you know, the data continues to show that actually this stuff makes sense. Uh, in, in business, again, uh, the, the primary role of, you know, the, 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 the sustainability, the ESG people are really to, again, kind of activate, promote, and drive that business case. You know, as, uh, as you heard Dan, you know, uh, say uh, before my role at CDP, I spent uh, 10 years in, in corporate sustainability in large uh, companies, including uh, three years in the energy sector. And, uh, and what Matt says is true. I mean, you know, you, you get in front of the board, you know, CFO was my best friend. Actually, he's uh, he's both the CFO and treasurer of NRG. I found out are both uh, Darden alums. Uh, <laughs> so when they found out I was uh, coming here because we had lunch uh, just the other day, they were like, "Yay!" <laughs> uh, but um, it's uh, you know you, you see it every day. In fact, uh, something else that uh, is part of what the, the the banks do now and that we did at NRG right before I left is uh, is. Uh, basically an ESG indexed uh, a credit revolver, a credit facility. So, you know, as a kind of capital intensive companies like NRG, about a two and a half billion dollar revolving line of credit uh, to finance working capital. And now a lot of banks and bank consortiums are basically indexing the cost of that, the, the rate of that uh, credit line to your sustainability performance, to where you get benefit if you can show improvement in your sustainability performance and you get, uh, um, you know, dinged if you don't. And so, I mean, these are very real, very measurable and very pertinent, you know, financial incentives. Because again, just a few basis points on a two and a half billion dollar revolving credit line for, you know, an RG is a $10 billion company. I mean, this isn't, you know, these are not like a drop in the bucket. These could be millions, tens of millions of dollars of impact. Uh, and so all of a sudden the business case for sustainable uh, practices becomes much, much stronger. And that's for me one of the most exciting developments is this is no longer about let's do the right thing. It's like let's do the right thing for the company, for our shareholders, uh, and, uh, and for society, which matters. But it's uh, certainly when you can align the interests of business with the interests of society, things just move way faster and bigger. Great. Can I just jump in on that? Please. Yes. So in the world, there's $90 trillion of managed assets. And of that, two trillion is branded or labeled ESG. So by that measure, we're, we're nowhere near there. And really important to note, 80% of that is in Europe. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you broaden your frame and say, well, what about a fund that uses, that integrates ESG issues, but the fund's not labeled ESG? You capture another 20 trillion. So, mm -hmm. People say that about a third of managed assets are managed sort of with an ESG consciousness lens tool. And if you talk to senior people in the asset management business, it's very clear that within a couple of years, there won't be un-ESG integrated investments. Mm -hmm. In the US, people are much more uh, comfortable with the notion of impact investing. Uh, so they drive their mission in a more direct issue specific way as opposed to the sort of broader, more diffuse ESG uh, flavor. As far as returns go, three years ago, a, 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 our research organization realized this was a huge opportunity. They assigned a guy who was a quant 
to do a huge big data analysis of what the, inter what the return implications are of ESG integration. And this individual came into this hugely skeptical that, this, that ESG would really be a thing and that it would add value. It turns out that if you do an ESG overlay on any investment style, whether it's a momentum style, a value style, a growth style, that an ESG overlay reduces volat volatility by a meaningful chunk and it increases return in a, in a more modest way. So in other words, it's a very sound investment approach. And it's the most highly growing investment approach. It's ESG branding labeled capitals growing at 8.5%. Nothing else is growing anywhere near like that. So it, it, the, the outlook is very positive, but to Bruno's point, we've got a heck of a long way to go. Mm -hmm. another, another term out there, so where the, the financial sector or um, investors are leading or, or lagging, Another term out there is the United Nations PRI, so the Principles for Responsible Investing, sort of this um, global initiatives to addre address this. Um, you know, how important is it to, you know, for, for firms like yourself or others to you know, um, use this uh, global initiatives? Um, because as you say, there's, you know, depending on the labeling, uh, you could be from a, a drop in the bucket to like, everyone claiming to be ESG. Uh, so, you know, tell us a little bit about what, what would be, um, what are the standards, what are, you know, what's real and what's not so real, how many people really walk the talk on the investment space. And, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a millennial or uh, someone thinking about their first savings uh, when they, they go out for, for financial products, what should they be looking out for to make sure their capital is, is being deployed uh, to, you know, to address this climate uh, challenge. So the PRI, um, we've been a signatory since 2007. What it means is that you will commit to do a series of, of ESG sort of integration, uh, the kind of thing that should be business as usual. You shouldn't have to sign up to a UN program to be sort of doing the right thing. Um, but Bruno, in his opening remarks, talked about uh, policy schemes that drive compliance mentality. And I do feel like PRI a little bit drove a compliance mentality in the asset management business because at the end of every year, you had to do a PRI report. You had to be a PRI compliance officer in your organization. They would go around and sort of nag portfolio managers to talk about. And so in that sense, if the way you really drive business change is say, this is a great opportunity, this will make your job better, it'll make you more competitive, it will drive return. That, that, the PRI kind of was a little bit not that. And, mm -hmm. and so, uh, and in the US, look, if you can make more money at it, uh, then we like it. Uh, and, and, and that, you know, I think commercially, um, as far as your own investing, uh, I would do a lot of diligence on the manager, number one, and I would, uh, there, there are great ESG managers. Uh, you got to look at a 10 year return. These funds have been around for a long time and look at them relative to whatever benchmark uh, is relevant, uh, it, whether it's the S&P 500 for equities or the Barclays Global Bond Index for fixed income and, and you know, make sure that, uh, that the manager's got a good track record. If I could add a couple of things, I mean, I think PRI, again, was at the time, I think, an important signal, um, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, we're really interested in what organizations are doing, not just, again, principles are a good kind of starting point, but ultimately what you're tracking is action. And so, you know, Matt mentioned, for example, the task force on climate-related financial disclosures, right? So this is about you know, really doing the work of, you know, climate-related scenario analysis, stress testing of your portfolio strategies or stress testing of your business strategies, accountability mechanisms like finance emissions, and, you know, really putting a lot more rigor to, you know, where is the direction, where is the movement, where is the action? Because again, Principles are important, but, you know, lots of organizations have signed things like the New York Declaration on Forests and committed to ending deforestation. Those commitments are actually uh, up to 2020. Almost all the companies that signed that declaration will fail to meet those today, uh, this year, uh, and not even close. I mean, it's not like they'll just miss it. Many of them never deployed capital to actually change 
the way they do business. So principles and, and commitments are a good start, but they don't drive accountability nearly as much as some of the mechanisms we've talked about, which is really when you align it with your, your specific practices, metrics, tools, systems, controls, et cetera. Great. So I'm going to throw in a last question, but I start to welcome you guys to think about questions and there are mics on both uh, aisles. So if you want to line up for questions as, as I throw in the, the, next, the next one. So some of the, let's talk through so those challenges in terms of the quality of the data to make sure that there is real change and not just co cosmetic change. To think that where should change happen? Should change happen in the usual players and in the, let's say, Europe or North America, or should we, uh, you know, are we not exporting the problem elsewhere to, you know, to other? So those, those would be like, where do you see the biggest challenges? Uh, and I know, you know, you've, CDP is a leader in terms of, of the data. Um, where, where else, you know, how do you actually keep track that companies are, you know, implementing this? And how do you think we should think about this in a more global perspective and not just the companies that are in the S&P 500, let's say the private companies and in companies around the world? Um, I mean, I, I can just give you kind of our broad lens and then I think Matt could speak more from, from their own organization. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, we pitch a pretty big tent at CDP. Again, we have eight, nearly 8,500 companies. Uh, not all are publicly traded. Uh, those, you know, if you count just those that are, it's over 50% of global market cap. So it's a decent sample in terms of who's providing information. Not everybody's providing the same level of completeness, accuracy, uh, and, uh, and quality, so that's part of the process. I mentioned, you know, I talked a lot about our A-list. I said if you don't, you know, disclose it's an F, and of course there's several letters in between F and A, and so that's part of the process, is, is really getting organizations to step into it. You know, any organization, regardless of where they are, you know, should and does step into it. We have 750 companies in China disclosing, including 50 of their largest publicly traded. We're rapidly building disclosure in places like India and Brazil and Indonesia and Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, not everybody's at the same level of sophistication and, uh, and uh, completeness, but that's, that's okay. That's the process is you start disclosing, you know, we provide feedback directly to you, your stakeholders provide feedback to you, whether it's those uh, from whom you borrow money, maybe it's the people who work for you, maybe it's the people who buy your goods. We have an entire supply chain program at CDP, about 130 large multinationals who collectively spend $4 trillion in procurement, who use CDP as a, uh, basically a supply chain disclosure mechanism. And I don't know if Catherine's in your audience yet, but actually Walmart was the inception for our uh, program about 13 years ago where they're like, hey, that thing you ask us to respond to every year, we want to use that with our supply chain. And so Walmart became, if you will, kind of the, uh, the founding partner of our supply chain program. And today, it's almost all of the large uh, companies you, uh, you would recognize. So that gets a lot of disclosure from non-publicly uh, non traded companies. We're also now seeing a lot more interest, and Matt touched on this earlier, actually uh, working with fixed income investors, including uh, uh, on, for example, we have a whole separate program that I didn't talk about today from city, states, and regions, so anything smaller than a country, about a thousand uh, city, states, and regions around the world, so, you know, they borrow a lot of money, and same, these kind of TCFD-aligned disclosures, uh, uh, their lenders and, and uh, bondholders really want to see that stuff, uh, see that from private equity, seeing that from hedge funds. Uh, as Matt mentioned, I mean, anybody who's managing or deploying money these days uh, can't be serious at doing their job if they don't take this into account. It's not the entire story, but it's certainly part of what they do uh, in order to be effective managers. I would say that uh, a couple big challenges. One of the biggest is just the aggregate energy demand growth in Asia. So China is the largest market for solar in the world. It's also the largest market for coal. And although the ratios are changing, they're not changing fast enough. And so, and, and it's, you know, people deserve energy. Right? So it's not about not giving them energy. And so that leads to a second big challenge, which is technology development for cleaner fossil fuels, but also energy storage so that renewables can be baseload. Right now, renewables, renewables are intermittent, and so you, you, kinda, you, you can't re really rely on them to be there 24-7, 365. And so, but if you could store energy, you would. 
uh, because it will give you a little bit of a buffer zone. And I think the third is political. Um, you know, right now, the, the United States is planning to pull itself out of the Paris Accord. Uh, the deregulation in the United States is breathtaking. And it's really important for industry to stand up and say, hey, this stuff is actually good for our business. We need policy certainty. Um, and, and so that's, I guess, a third challenge. Let's turn it back before the students. What are the opportunities for the students here in the room before we hear from them? So wherever you end up, uh, and I'm, I, 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 would, I, I can speak for sure about J.P. Morgan. I can speak probably for all the other banks, and I can speak maybe for anything else outside that industry. But wherever you end up, uh, you, you, you're, if, you're, if you don't have the word sustainable in your title, it doesn't matter because there's all kinds of opportunities. I get so many emails from young people who just joined the firm as an analyst or an associate someplace, and they want to get involved, they want to help out. And so we have these core teams around the firm. We plug those kinds of people into what we're trying to do, and they're able to take it back. Uh, you'll find, you'll be surprised at how many different businesses are chasing some version of ESG. Uh, and so th there are, regardless of what team you're going in on, keep your eyes open and, and ask questions. I would also caution you, don't jump too quick. Uh, I do find people are in a rush and they get in there and, and they say to their new boss, hey, I really want to do that. And it's like, wait a minute, that's not your job. Uh, and, and so um, there's a little bit of, of just, you know, timing it right. And, um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I, I would echo that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what you do in an organization, any organization, a city, a company, a, a university, a nonprofit. What we just talked about matters to how you're going to do your job. I had somebody from HR ask me, I really want it. It's like, wow, you know, what do you guys do in HR? You do incentive management. You do performance management. You do learning and development. Like, we're literally trying to change how we do everything. Your job is to make that happen in an organization and to create like you know so it's like oh wow like i never thought of hr and sustainability like in the same breath i always thought i have to be either in like procurement or in you know uh public affairs or so one every job has an opportunity to bring this the, the other thing i'll say is uh, where, where i found certainly my own success but when i see success in others is is this one really good organizational agility, right? Don't let org charts kind of get in the way. Just understand how does power flow, how do decisions get made, how to build kind of virtual coalitions. Two, be really good at understanding, again, regardless of where your role is, you know, the business acumen, the financial acumen, how does your organization make money or manage money? Mm -hmm. uh, who does it serve uh, and, and re really learn how to be able to talk about the big picture, not just from kind of either your place of activism, your place of interest, or your place of organizational responsibility. So have that system level view, but then bring that unique voice and expertise of why should you be in the room? Why will a better decision be made if you're in the room than if you're not? Why will somebody be more successful if they work with you than if they work around you? And if you keep asking yourself that question, you're gonna keep coming up with better answers. Great. So let me start there and then we take turns, please. Hi, my name is Anna Douglas. I'm from Tuck School of Business. And um, yesterday we spoke about keeping the humanity of all the various business actors in mind as it relates to climate change when we we're discussing these types of issues. So um, given the possibility that there may be very well-intentioned people who earnestly do care about these issues at companies in very difficult to mitigate industries like aviation, shipping, et cetera. Um, what tactical and strategic advice would you give or what would you ask of a company whose core business function directly contributes to climate change right now as it relates to shaping a CSR program specifically? My view, there's no company that can't have a climate change strategy. There's no company that can't have an ESG strategy. The issues will bubble up in different places. If you're salesforce.com, it's one. For Delta Airlines, it's another. You may have seen Delta announce it's going carbon neutral. Um, so I, I, when we talk to anybody uh, in the most difficult to mitigate industries, the question is what, what can you do, not, not what you can't do. And uh, so, and the other thing is, actually, even more importantly, as I get older, I realize 
this is a really rich conversation. And, and, and for a bank to be going to its client, it, it's, it's, it's about society. It's about the good of, of, of people and the planet. And it's way more interesting to the client than a lot of the other conversations we want to have with them about their balance sheet. Um, and so in that sense, there's no, and I don't, I don't have a specific for you, but there's, n there's no place that you shouldn't be having this conversation. And if you're going in to a, as an employee to a hard to mitigate industry, you will find there are people in those companies whose job this is and, and find them. Yeah, I was just going to ask about on a very tactical level. Again, we work with organizations literally in all of the hardest sectors from, you know, cement and steel and aviation is a, a good place to start a science-based target. You know, there's sector-specific guidance for the science-based target initiative. The science-based target is you give the world a, a message, a commitment of we understand where we need to get to, not just what we think we can do. So you start with the end in mind, and that generates a whole host of really interesting conversations from people usually who are super interested. I mean, you see even the big oil and gas companies are full of really smart chemical engineers and all kinds of people who are really eager to find new solutions. So the science-based target framework is actually a really good place to say, that's what we need to get to. There's a 2030 interim and then a 2050 kind of, you know, basically net zero. And you've seen literally, again, just in the last few weeks, big oil and gas, aviation, big, uh, big industry set science-based targets because, not because they already know how to meet them, but because they know they have to. And we just hired a tough grad on my team. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Liz. Um, I'm an MBA student at Stern. Um, as someone who comes from the nonprofit world and is now getting my MBA, I'd be curious, Matt, to hear your journey from <laughs> Greenpeace to JP Morgan. It's a messy one. Um, <laughs> I, the Greenpeace thing was like, okay, I get, I share the mission, I don't like the strategy. It's, I don't want to dump fish on the Norwegian embassy steps. It's just not something I really <laughs> care to do. Um, and so, it, but it was an important learning experience. And then I, I did a mainstream thing. Then I went back and got an MBA and a an, master's in international relations. And literally coming out of there, I had a choice between being an investment banker at Merrill Lynch or starting a nonprofit environmental group focused on business and the environment. This is in 1988. And I chose the latter, it was suicidally. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and then one thing led to another. We merged in with the World Resources Institute, which is a large think tank on these issues. Uh, and then at some point, somebody said to me, when does the statute of limitations on your claiming to be a business person end? Because <laughs> I had been in NGOs by then for 13 years. And I, out of kind of desperation, started a consulting company called Sustainable Finance. There was no strategy. It was just relationships. It was all banks. And then we got really good at, at learning. We had 50 clients, and we were global. We were from Indonesia to Brazil to all over Europe and North America. And we got really knowledgeable about how banks need to manage environmental and social issues. And then PwC bought us. I mean, like, what? That was like a real shocker. Uh, and then about four years later, J.P. Morgan had a, a, um, a, a vacancy in this role, which is, it's evolved. It's, it's expanded a lot. We have impact investing now uh, in our group, uh, and we have a whole client-facing corporate responsibility thing, plus the sustainability thing. And it's, you know, my mom used to always tell me, it doesn't matter what you do, just do it well. It sounds a little vapid, but it's really true. There's never been a job I had that I wasn't invited back to. And so it just, one thing led to the next. And it's really, it's a terrible response to your question because it's super random. Um, but it's just, if you're a planner, my career path is not for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, please. Hi, I'm Hunter Hopcroft from Darden. Um, Bruno, you touched on it briefly with regards to 401ks, but I'm interested from an asset management standpoint, how you handle impact and ESG in light of a fiduciary standard and if there's a regulatory opportunity to unlock more capital by changing that fiduciary standard to include some of these concepts? So, I mean, I think the... As a, as a faculty, let's explain fiduciary duty for you. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the basic idea is that 
especially a lot of these programs, retirement plans, et cetera, are managed by a set of people who basically say, you know, their obligation is controlled by a set of guidelines. So just like if you're on a board of directors, your fiduciary responsibility is the proper management and governance of uh, the, the company's business and assets on behalf of shareholders. If you're managing money, it's the same. It's basically you're making sure that people will not make bad decisions, I guess, is a, is a quick way to say it. And it's been a frustrating space. You know, under the Obama administration, the, uh, um, I think it was the Department of Labor or somebody, yeah. uh, this thing called ERISA, uh, which I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but they give guidance to, to retirement plans and things like that. And they gave guidance basically saying, if you don't consider ESG in retirement portfolios, you're not doing your fiduciary re responsibility. The Trump administration came in and gave the exact opposite <laughs> guidance saying, if you're considering ESG, you might be jeopardizing your fiduciary responsibility. I think to what we said earlier, in fact, now, the track record is there's plenty of evidence that says an ESG lens on portfolio at almost in any asset class yields better performance and, and actually better risk adjusted returns. Uh, I think that message hasn't always kind of trickled into all the people who feel that, you know, it's safer to just, you know, I'll just buy the S&P 500 and I'll be fine. You know, that if I introduce some of these other things. So it, it's, I think it's going to take, frankly, a, a bigger voice from, from employees demanding better choices. In fact, when I joined CDP, uh, uh, that's what we did. I actually thought our, our retirement plan was, was not necessarily as aligned with our values. And so we demanded, we told our, our manager, it's like, we're, we're going to leave because you don't have the right choices. They're like, wait, we keep hearing this from everybody. Let us build one for you. And we did. And so I think it's all of you, wherever you go work, start asking. It's like, hey, you know, I want to invest in my retirement. I just don't have the, the right choices. Thank you. Hi, my name is Catherine Chute. I'm from the Herb Institute at the University of Michigan. Uh, so earlier, Dan Vermeer mentioned the value of MBAs bringing cutting edge knowledge to businesses after they graduate. I'm curious what specific skills or tools or certifications you would recommend pursuing while we are in school so that we can best prioritize decisions when we enter as sustainability professionals. So in a bank, you need to know Excel backward, forward, upside down. <laughs> um, uh, the people who really understand PowerPoint and, and really how to communicate with PowerPoint as opposed to how to confuse with PowerPoint, um, that's really great. And then it sounds sort of mundane, but we need critical thinkers. We need people who can think holistically, think laterally. Bruno was getting at this a little bit earlier. And you need to think clearly. There's a lot of fuzzy thinking in, in this and needs to be data driven. So practice up your quant skills, but link the quant to logic and make sure you have a story. Make, always make sure there's a story that has meaning because what you find, you get into these firms and, and your CEO thinks about this 20 seconds a month. And, and, but when that 20 seconds hit, hits, you better be clear. I'll catch our CEO in an elevator, uh, now, now we're invited to their meetings to present. But in the beginning, it was like, what's your story? And you have to, that notion of an elevator pitch, it's so critical, and it has to be exciting. They have to say, oh, I wanna work with that person. And, and that's really all it is. It's not magic. Yeah, I would add, I mean, there's a handful of things, again, depending on your area of interest. You know, if you're going in finance, for example, there's something called the FSA, the finance, uh, Fundamentals of Sustainability Accounting. It's a self-driven uh, self course uh, organized actually by, I think, SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Uh, pretty, you know, I think maybe 15, 20 hours of work, uh, self-guided. You know, if you come in and you can speak to that, great. You know, things like the GRI Global Reporting Initiative that talks about the, again, you don't necessarily have to go do the course. All their material is free on their website. Definitely spend a couple of hours reading through the framework of the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. So I think some of that, like again, you don't need to go become an expert, but know how to talk about it, know what it is. And then I would just double down on what Matt just said. I think the power of storytelling in business is critical in this space. Again, the data really, really matters, but it is not the story. If all, I mean, scientists have been coming with data for the last 40 years and look where it got them, right? We need to be able to talk about 
in the language of the organization, in the cultural lingo of the organization, in the vision space of the organization of why this makes sense, why this matters, and then the data backs you up. But again, the data is not the story. The story is why is this a better future for the organization than the, al the alternative, sorry. Okay. So to be fair, we have two minutes and there are six people lining up. So what I, I'll try to do is just, let's get all, uh, Five, all right. So we're let's get all five questions, and then you guys pick one each, <laughs> and, and that. So let's go that really quick. So you have a forty percent chance of getting your question, <laughs> but really quick, please. I hear the the perspective on ESG really varies depending on who we're speaking to. When we have the opportunity to hear from people in the finance industry, they tell us that ESG is important to them. But when we have the opportunity to speak to people from other industries, they tell us that their investors don't care about their ESG initiatives at all. Why the gap? Second one, please. <laughs> gap, number one, yes. We heard a lot uh, in the past uh, day about uh, disclosure, and I was just wondering, that's, uh, and uh, setting science-based targets, so let's suppose a company does set science-based targets, um, what mechanisms are in place to actually hold them accountable to achieving these targets? You mentioned previously that deforestation targets were just not met, uh, not even by a, by a, by a, by a small uh, amount. Okay. And right. then the second part is in energy intense, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> energy intensive industries, I'm curious if there is disclosure to shareholders that if they do achieve these targets, there's reduced returns. Perfect. I think so much. Uh, so I'm asking about the difference between what investors sort of say that they want and then what they end up actually wanting, but uh, sort of more specifically uh, thinking about NRG, for example, the previous CEO had a big vision to sort of transform NRG and be more uh, focused on renewable energy, and then now in the news, NG CEO is stepping down, um, sort of tried to transform in the same way. Obviously, these situations are more complicated than they sort of appear to us, but uh, both situations were trying to make big investments in renewable energy and uh, sort of investors saying, yeah, that's what we want, but then actually not um, sort of being able to uh, meet the expectations that investors wanted and sort of getting pushed out because they tried to yeah. make these big revolutionary changes. I mean, yeah, right. so it is, it is a little more complicated, but I would we're be curious to hear what you thought about we're at minus being one penalized. <laughs> yes. So this is all like for us to keep all these questions because I think we're hearing from you guys that you know a lot of this is unresolved. Um, how do you discern between companies who are making material steps to actually address ESG issues versus just buying racks and purchasing offsets? Um, like how do you view that difference? Last question please. Thank you. Last one ties into that, how you have the conversation. For example, UVA's endowment is 9.6 billion. They're bragging a return of 11.4 in some years, 10.9 over 20 years. How do you have a conversation with them about the money we have here at UVA and many of our other you know, partner schools, how we should be spending it and how we should be investing it? Great, so back to you guys, just how do we get answers, like all these five questions? <laughs> in, in like, where, where do we go next? Well, well, I like the gap question because that I hear internally all the time. I hear it from our senior leadership who deals with our investors. And the answer, in my view, is investors care about growth and margin. Those two things drive return. And if you don't frame your ESG narrative as a growth and margin story, then it's not interesting to an investor. And that's really it. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I mean, I'll say two things. One is actually I plan on being here all day. So, you know, uh, if you want to grab me at some point and have more specific questions about either, you know, what does that accountability framework look like? Actually, there's a decent amount of info on, like, because uh, uh, actually that is the difference, for example, with the SBTI. When people say we never hear about our ESG from our investors, they're wrong. They're just not in the room. Uh, these questions never come up on earnings calls because that's not who shows up on earnings calls. It's the sell side analyst that, you know, it's so when people say, well, we never get the question on the quarterly earnings call, it's like, yeah, because that's not where the conversation is. Uh, and so I think it's, you know, uh, and I think you heard it from Matt, there's not a single organization out there that's either deploying capital or borrowing money that's not thinking or talking about this stuff. Um, and then more generally, again, uh, 
something you should all be doing is network as much as you can, you know, reach out to people that you have access to, uh, including ourselves, uh, to, uh, to drill down and again try to bring a little bit of that X factor in, in your own conversations. Great. Well, what a great start for the morning. So, you know, uh, thank, let's all thank Matt and Bruno for the opportunity. Thank you.